I'm Welcome. There's this uh, my name is Ben Fitzgerald. Uh, I run the Technology and National Security Program here at CNAS. Uh, I apologize if I seem a little distracted during this conversation. We aren't allowed to have cell phones up here because of signals interference. So I've been kitted out with this new thing called a watch. Um, and I've been trying to figure out the functionality. Apparently the only thing it does is tell the time, which seems very inefficient. Um, so I'm going to keep figuring that out as we talk. Um, the Technology and National Security Program at CNAS explores the relationship between technology, strategy, and business. We're particularly interested in the pace and the location of innovation um, and the impact of that on national security. Uh, given that that is our research agenda, we were very, very excited when we had the opportunity to undertake uh, the project we're going to be discussing today, which is uh, called Creative Disruption. Uh, now you can pick up physical copies of the report at the back, or you can download them on, on your device, not apparently on your watch, um, but, but we'll make do. Um, we're not going to go line by line through the report here. We're going to talk about some broader topics. But in, in summary, the, the project and the report looked at a number of critical trends, particularly the rapid diffusion of technology globally, the shift in the locus of innovation moving from the military industrial complex that Eisenhower talked about or warned us about and moving into a, a more purely commercial um, environment. And really we, we sort of highlighted the predictable disruption that occurs when those trends run into a largely unchanging government approach to, to military technology. And our core argument is that we, need, that we can no longer ride on the coattails of the strategic brilliance of the Cold War offset strategy and that we need to establish a new paradigm. So today we're going to explore that problem space and unpack those challenges. We're very fortunate to have the uh, co-chairs of the task force, uh, the Honorable William Lynn and Admiral uh, James Devritis. Um, you can read their storied careers in your, uh, in, in, in your um, guides um, that you have in your hands. Um, from, from my perspective as, as the guy sort of doing the day-to-day -day running of the project, I benefited significantly from Bill's uh, ability to talk strategically from the perspective of a very senior leadership position in the Pentagon and also a very senior leadership position running an international defense business. And Admiral Stavridis was really able to help us identify and parse critical global trends and understand the strategic implications of that. So with that in mind, I'm just going to jump in and start asking some questions and we can just do some back and forth here. Sure. Um, I'm interested if we could start out by trying to sort of separate the signal and the noise in the strategic environment. What are the key challenges and, and opportunities that you guys see are facing the US, its allies, and its industry in this strategy, technology, business paradigm? Bill, do you have a particular thoughts that you'd like to? Uh, sure. I mean, I, I think Ben, uh, first, Ben, thank you for uh, organizing and, and uh, making uh, Jim and I and the, and the rest of the group look good with the, the product <laughs> that, uh, exactly. that you produced. Um, I, I think the key in, uh, is your point, signal and noise. As you look at industrial structure, I think the, the key thing to do is to separate, are we, is this in the normal just pulling and hauling of pressures and counter pressures and developments that incrementally change uh, the, the nature of the industry and the structure, or do we at a, at a point of fundamental shift? Hmm. And I think the, the argument that I think, that I think Jim agrees and is, is in the study is that we're more at that fundamental tipping point that it, this is more like uh, the last couple of points than it is the, the, uh, a normal time. By the last couple of changes, I mean the industry fundamentally changed in the U.S. at World War II. We went from a shipyard arsenal system into a, a commercially based system, uh, largely uh, in co commercial conglomerates, each of the major conglomerates, Ford, General Motors, eventually IBM, General Electric, had defense divisions, and that's how the U.S. maintains its industrial advantage. That lasted until the end of the Cold War, and then we moved from a period of conglomerates, as we consolidated, we moved to a, a series of large specialists, Lockheed, Northrop, Raytheon, and, and so on. I think things are shifting again as the budget is coming down, as we're seeing more and more uh, commercial technologies come into defense, as, the industry is globalizing, those changes are gathering to force another fundamental shift. And I think the, the key in both industry and government is to recognize the nature of that change and to try and manage it. So that, that's, I think, the signal that we're seeing amid all this noise. 
Interesting, Admiral. From your Let me uh, pick up on on Bill's comment. First of all, again, uh, Ben, thank you. This has been a, a wonderful experience working with you and the CNAS team. Um, I think other things are globalizing as well. Um, violent extremism is globalizing. Um, religious internecine conflict. We see uh, 500,000 people, refugees moving out of Mosul, Iraq, in a, what is essentially a Sunni Shia religious war, that's globalizing and that's a deep concern. I, I'm also very, very worried about what I call convergence, um, which is the idea that weapons of mass destruction can potentially move not on traditional ballistic missile paths, but on narcotics routes, um, in and amongst refugees, in these vast movements that come all around the globe. Um, so all of that is diffusing, much as, as Bill makes the excellent point about the industry. Um, so that's kind of the challenge, I think, the Uber challenge. Um, what are the opportunities? And I think there, uh, there's good news, and it's this exquisite network of allies, partners, and friends that the United States enjoys. And we ought to try and think a little how that fits into this globalization, because I think that's a real opportunity upside for us. Mm. And so when we look through some of those trends and those changes, a lot of those are driven by technology, especially commercial technology. Uh, the United States Army is increasingly talking about uh, conflict and the increased rate of human interaction. Mm -hmm. um, from your perspective, Admiral, how do you see these increasing commercial technologies that have a lot of positive benefits from a war fighting or from a military strategic perspective, what are the effects? Well, it's obviously extremely exciting to see the acceleration of technology and we all continue to be very excited by work at places like DARPA, um, but let's face it, when you try and create a transmission belt that goes from these nimble, swift commercial technologies and everything from big data to unmanned vehicles, getting that transmission belt so that those technologies end up useful and in the hands of operators is extremely challenging. And so kind of what's in the middle and it's the defense industry. Yeah. So I think we've got work to do in creating a transmission belt um, or finding ways that we can more quickly move those technologies. Maybe Bill could address how that works. Yeah, I'd be fascinated to hear your thoughts on that. Sure. Well, I mean, I, I think the, your fundamental premise is right. There's, there's more commercial technology content in defense uh, than there has been the past couple of decades. There's a commercialization of defense in that uh, we've just seen even in the last four or five years, I think the commercial content of defense uh, acquisitions has risen from about 10% to about 30%. Uh, I think you're also seeing at the same time, and a related is that defense uh, companies are investing less as a percentage of their revenue than they, mm -hmm. they used to. Uh, so you're seeing both uh, the technologies themselves, whether it's IT-based or bio-based or nano-based, uh, are more originating in the, in the commercial industry than they were before. And we're seeing, the, relatedly, the defense industry investing somewhat less. So to, to maintain our technological edge, what you're going to have to see is the defense sector is going to have to become more of an importer than we've been in the past. So in, in the past, we've been, uh, the balance has been more towards export. We developed, you know, GPS, even the internet, you know, started with ARPANET. And that now, I, and, and so the model was to develop things internally and then, and then push them out. I, we still need to do that in some cases, uh, but in many more cases, we're gonna have to pull commercial technologies mm -hmm. in and militarize and, and, and operationalize them. And I think we need to develop an industrial structure, structure that's able to do that and we need uh, the Defense Department to lower the barriers to entry to allow those commercial technologies to move into the defense sector. So I think that that makes uh, complete sense, and we can see that there are a number of benefits associated with using commercial technology, but when we think about this from a warfighting perspective, how does one military force generate advantage over another military force if we're all drawing from similar technology bases? I don't know, from a warfighting perspective, how, how, how do you see that working out? Well, the first foremost is by investment in people. Yeah. Um, in other words, two opponents that have the same technology, if you have the better people, you'll succeed. And so um, that gets into human resource management and incentivization of the right kind of people. 
um, and retaining them and continuing, especially in this era of the all-volunteer force, critically important. So I'd, I'd put people kind of at the top of my list. Mm. Um, I think a, a, a second way is through intelligence. Mm -hmm. um, so again, if two sets of opponents have roughly comparable equipment and kit, um, the one that has better intelligence and information, I think, has, a, has obviously a significant advantage. Mm. And then thirdly, this could be considered part of the kit, but I think is, is a bit separate, is cyber and the ability mm -hmm. to use cyber tools. Um, so I think there are three that I'd, I'd deploy as ideas. Interesting. Bill, from your perspective, either from a Pentagon or from a defense industry perspective? Well, well I think I'd actually, Ben, fight the premise of your question, that, sure. we, that, we, should f that we should accept a, a level playing field in terms of the technology yeah. and industrial base. Yeah. I mean, yeah. the, the, a major, the, maybe the core advantage the U.S. has had in security for over a century has been the strength of its technological and industrial base. Mm -hmm. the, we, we've been able to overwhelm opponents with the superiority of our techn technology, the ability to mobilize our industry. I, I don't think we should think about giving that up. No. I think things are changing, if that's what you're saying, and I think we need to adapt to those changes, but we should adapt to those changes in a way that maintains that superiority. The, together with our allies, I think we do still have access and control of, of most of the world's uh, great technologies. I think it's a matter of ensuring that the structure allows us to use that, uh, use those technologies in a way that maintains our, our military superiority. Mm. So we can't have a one-size-fits-all approach yeah. to this. And we, and we basically shouldn't accept the level playing field. Absolutely. We, absolutely. we should maintain our advantage. So then, um, speaking of advantage, from, from a, a U.S. and allied perspective, where, where do we not have advantage right now? Where, where are we vulner vulnerable? Are there specific uh, risks that you guys see that, that, that you worry about? Uh, Bill? Well, uh, Jim, Jim mentioned uh, cyber. I, you know, I, I think we have advantages in cyber. I think, uh, in terms of uh, the, our information technology is equal or superior, I think, to others. But we're also more dependent on it mm. than than anyone else, and so that in itself is a vulnerability. So I, I, I think that we we need to maintain our advantage in information technology, but we need to be able to protect not just that advantage, but to protect our systems from asymmetrical attacks, that people that get underneath those systems with cyber attacks rather than just d direct attacks. I think that's a fundamental uh, uh, asymmetrical vulnerability we face. Mm -hmm. I, I agree. I would, I would add that we're not particularly good at things like language, culture, understanding of historical context. Um, those are areas where others seem to do better than we do. And Department of Defense, two and a half million, two and a half million people, only 8% speak a second language. Um, we devote almost nothing to really understanding um, culture, history, literature, all of these things provide context for us. So I, I think we could do better, and it gets back to the point I was making earlier about investing in people. And, and that's the kind of investment that I think can be helpful over the long throw. I think the convergence point is interesting as well. In increasingly, we can't look at technology by itself. It's the relationship between all of these things and how they come yeah. together, together at any one point. Um, if we think about um, prior warfighting regimes, Bill, you were talking about sort of the industrial era of warfare. We've spoken about the Cold War era, um, where, where we can see the you know a, a blitzkrieg of multiple types of platforms com co coming together, or in the offset strategy, where we had a regime of stealth, precision, C4 ISR. Um, Actually, for those of you who are interested in, in warfighting regimes, watch for Paul Charest's uh, presentation a little bit later, which will talk about a robotics heavy regime. It's going to blow your minds. It's going to be amazing. Um, <laughs> the, um, w when we think about those sort of regimes, what do you think? A lot of them were characterized by big bets on technologies that sort of formed the pillar of what we were doing. What do you think those next big bets should be? Or are we entering an era where we can't afford to make big bets in that way, that we need to be more, more diverse in our approach to technology? Bill, what are your thoughts on this? Well, I mean, you've, in the conversation we've named some of them, it's, it's mm -hmm. you know, obviously if I was really good, I'd, I'd be with, you know, Dennis Bovin on Wall Street and investing <laughs> in these. But, but uh, um, the, you know, obviously cyber, you know, all the vehicles are moving towards unmanned, you know, bio, nanotechnology, probably it's a little, maybe a step further away, directed energy. 
the, the, those are clearly you know, going to shape the future. I, I think there we, and Jim would be more expert this than I, but it, it's not just the technology, but it's how you use it. Yeah. Uh, I mean, the, the, the French had more tanks in 1940 than the Germans. They just didn't know how to use them. They didn't, have, they didn't have the Blitzkrieg. They didn't know how to combine them with radios. They didn't have the doctrine. So I think as we, as we look at technologies, it's not just the technology. Yeah. It's how do we put them into an operational concept, into a doctrine, and to be able to use those uh, militarily. You're speaking my language here. Um, I, don't know. I would add to the very good list that Bill just ticked off. Uh, special forces. Mm -hmm. I, I think, again, it's the people investment. It's, it's creating operators who are extremely capable uh, individually. And then to Bill's point about how you use it, I, I think the synergies between cyber, unmanned special forces, that triad, I think, are uh, really worth exploring. And, and guess who's exploring it pretty well right now in Ukraine yeah. uh, is Putin's military. But we understand those synergies in this um, kind of emerging triangle of uh, cyber, unmanned, and special forces and how they can fit together. Uh, that's interesting. So speaking of synergies and, and things coming together, especially in, in, in that part of the world, um, as a former Supreme Allied Commander of Europe, what, what are your thoughts about the, the changes to our alliance environment? Uh, or interoperability, or all of those sort of issues associated with the kind of changes that we're seeing in the technology mm -hmm. environment? Well, first of all, if we look at the United States and we think about what are our strengths, um, we have, as we're learning, a great deal of strength in the energy dimension. We have a higher education system that's the envy of the world. We're a magnet for uh, immigration. We have still very strong innovation. Our demographics are good. Um, we've got lots of advantages. One that I always put on that list is this, uh, as I said before, this exquisite network of allies, partners, and friends, which are slightly different things. But if you look and you start with NATO, here are 28 countries with 52% of the world's GDP. Mm. Let, let me say that again. Yeah. 28 <coughs> countries, 52% of the world's GDP. And as, as is widely known, the United States spends, let's say, 500 billion on defense, very roughly. Uh, our European allies, much maligned, and they should spend more, but they spend somewhere between 250 and 300 billion dollars a year on defense. Not all of it spent perfectly, uh, to our view, but that's 900 billion dollars yeah. in defense. And then if we add Japan, Australia, South Korea, other allies, and then we start adding in friends, that is a huge, yeah. huge amount of resources. Um, so the question is, back to Bill's point, it, it, it's not just how much you have in the bank, it's how you deploy the cash. Mm -hmm. And so are we buying the right things? Uh, are we talking to our allies about uh, rationalization between what we buy, what the Danes buy, what the French buy, what the Australians buy, what the Japanese buy, et cetera? I think that is an area that is well worth exploring. And I think it, it also gets into the defense sector, which Bill is probably more qualified than I to talk. Yeah, absolutely. And the key point here is never underestimate the Australians. We will we'll surprise you every time. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Ben is Australian, by the way, and, um, and he, you also have the best beard uh, I have seen uh, okay. it's, it's, uh, in it's recent a, history. It's a tribute to Ned <laughs> Kelly. The, um, so I was actually going to introduce myself as Zach Galifianakis earlier, but I, I, deci I decided against it. Um, so at the same time as, as, as we look at uh, the, the, the opportunities for, co for collaboration, but we're seeing a significant downward pressure on defense budget domestically and internationally. What does that mean for international collaboration either between nations or between defense industry um, actors? Well, uh, build on what, what Jim was saying. Is, is the, obviously there is pressure, not just in the United States, downward pressure, but probably even more so uh, in, in Europe and there, we are worried that that downward pressure uh, is going to create gaps between our capabilities and the, and the European, our allies' capabilities, and we're not going to be able to network and, and, yeah. and work together and have the same level of technology. And I think that's the right worry. I'm not, I'm sure, I'm not sure sometimes that we don't focus too much on the absolute levels of defense spending. As Jim said, there's, there's an awful lot of spending on, on our side out there. The question is, are we spending it on the right things? And the, sort of the, the other path, 
with, with NATO and our allies is to try and focus more of the spending on common goods rather than the individual priorities of nations. Now, that's an, uh, another challenge politically, just as you know, spending more on defense is a, a political challenge to, because of other priorities. Nevertheless, I think that's probably the more surmountable political challenge and it's probably where we're gonna get more payoff is, is if we can develop those collaborative capabilities, if we can have more joint programs, if we can distribute the, uh, the, the military labor in a, in a more sensible fashion across those 28 nations, I think that's gonna pay, have a payoff even at the same spending levels. Yeah, interesting. So uh, if, if we think about new approaches and, and sort of uh, invariably with any project or, or, or discussion about defense industry, we come back to this issue of reform, which is critically important and always threatens to put me into a micro sleep when we get into the details. But r regardless, we, we can't do a number of the things we want without reform. So what are your views on what's required, what's realistic, what should we be hoping for? Um, Bill, from your perspective, and then, and then Admiral from your Sure. Well, uh, you know, re when you talk about reform, you start with, with DOD, and, and I mentioned already that I think one of the keys is lowering barriers to entry in terms of uh, defense acquisition. Uh, now, we've been talking about defense acquisition reform, you know, I think it goes back to the Revolutionary War when they originally tried to build frigates in one shipyard yeah. and end up in, ended up in seven different yards with seven different designs. So this is not a new, new problem. Uh, it, it's a, it's a, but it, and it's an overwhelming challenge and you just have to chip away at it. I think the contribution here should be, we shouldn't just be looking at improving performance on cost and improving performance on schedule. We need also to lower our, the barriers uh, to entry. On the industry side, uh, I think we're gonna have to, defense industry is embarked now on a relatively short-term uh, strategy of, of, of moving cash back to shareholders and that's mm -hmm. protecting share prices. It's not a long-term strategy though in terms of, of protecting the industry towards the future. And I think you're starting now to see uh, some, uh, some companies start to raise their investment levels. And I think that's gonna be uh, uh, critical if we're gonna maintain that, uh, that structure going forward. So I think that's, that's a reform we need on the industry side. Interesting, and, and this is a fascinating point that we covered. Uh, actually, I should qualify what fascinating is or isn't in this audience, but um, as we were looking at this, we, we saw that very high share prices for a number of defense industry actors right now, uh, as, we, as we unpacked it, and Bill really helped us understand this, it's actually due to short-term uh, decision-making about cash rather than long-term investments. So we, we're potentially walking up to a precipice uh, wherein when, when the crunch really hits, we won't have cash on hand, we won't be able to get, we won't have liquidity to make good investments, and we will have essentially mortgaged our future, uh, which I think was something that I hadn't understood prior to starting this project and is an important issue for us to understand. Um, but regardless, Admiral, I'm interested in Bill, I think, really hit it on defense reform, and, and mm -hmm. I'll just say I think it probably goes back to the Peloponnesian Wars when the <laughs> Greeks were trying to figure out whether you, where to get their bronze swords made. The uh, wrong sandals for the run to marathon. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. But um, I do think as the operator uh, mm -hmm. at the, on the podium, um, there's real hunger, for, again, for this transmission belt. Um, your operators know the world, they see these new technologies exploding, and yet it, it, it's this chimera that's just always just beyond your reach. Yeah. I, I'm Greek-American, so I'm allowed to use uh, the myth of Tantalus, and Tantalus nice. was the guy who was tied to the tree, he was punished by the gods, and they would put these wonderful juicy apples in front of him and the wind would blow them just out of his reach. That's sometimes how the operators feel when they see these exciting technologies bubbling and it's, when's it gonna get here? Well, it's gotta get through this transmission belt. So uh, I'll simply convey the frustration from the operational end of this thing. And I recognize it's been worked on and we continue to work on it. And studies like this, I think, help because they put the, the question forward again. You may also have inadvertently just named the next uh, key drone that the United States invests in. <laughs> we'll see, you should try, 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 try to trademark that and see, see what we can get. Persistent standoff ISR or something. Exactly. Um, so as, 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 as we, uh, sorry, sorry. The, uh, uh, I try to use my, my, my powers for good, not for evil. The, um, as, we, as we think about this, this issue of, of 
big things. Mm -hmm. I, I completely agree. We're always hoping for the next big thing. Yeah. Often that's, uh, it, it doesn't arrive. But, but if we're thinking about them, what should we be thinking about in terms of the next big thing? What, what are we missing? Is it, is it something that, that is just completely off our radar? Um, Bill, from your, oh, sorry, Admiral, um, if, if, you, if, you, if you've got something in the tube, you should definitely shoot I, it. I do, um, and it's, it's bio, yeah. it's biology. Yeah, Bill's, Bill's mentioned that in a kind of a fleeting way, but I, I would really stop and hit pause and think about bio as follows. We're clearly in the age of information. We're very excited about it. Our new iPhone 6S is coming out. I, I think we're actually passing through the age of information in the sense that it's becoming ubiquitous. It's like the air we breathe. The next big thing is not information, in my view. It's biology. And, and over the 10 to 20 year future, the changes in human life expectancy, human performance enhancement, um, you know, think Wolverine. Uh, it's really not as crazy as you begin to think. Sleep cycles, strength. Um, fusion of the body with technologies for information, um, biomass, energy from biomass, synthetic crop, I, the changes that are coming broadly sociologically I think are profound, little appreciated, ill understood, and they have ripple effect into the world of security and defense. So I think thinking about that coherently um, early days, it, it would make some sense. I think that's fascinating. The, um, the, the, the key for me, uh, bellwether of where things are going for, for all this sort of stuff is uh, science fiction, uh, let's call it literature. Um, and I just, I just read my first, um, and most of those books exist in a world of physics. Mm -hmm. um, I just read my first um, bio-related one, which is called The Wind-Up Girl. If any of you uh, sci-fi geeks are out there looking for something to read, that's my key recommendation mm -hmm. from this panel. Um, Bill, from your perspective, what are the big things that we should be thinking about that we're not? Well, let me take a little bit different tack than, than Jim took, and this is almost the last big thing, but it hasn't happened, and I think we've almost uh, driven past it, and we shouldn't. And I think that's the, the vulnerability of our critical infrastructure to yep. cyber attack. I, yep. I think since it hasn't happened, people assume it's not going to. And I think it just, it's developing, uh, maybe not very quickly, but it's developing such that the, uh, we still have our, our power infrastructure, our, our economic infrastructure, our, you know, the, the financial networks uh, are, are deeply vulnerable, I think, to uh, cyber attacks and cyber attacks from a number of sources. It would worry me less if it was just major nation states <coughs> because there the deterrent model applies. There, there's, unless we're in a, in a conflict, a very serious conflict, very, very unlikely a major nation state's going to mm -hmm. undertake that kind of attack because of the response we'd make. But rogue states, Iran, North Korea, are developing these kinds of capabilities, much less ability to deter them because we're already doing most of the things that we would use to deter them. Uh, and then terrorist groups, they haven't gone down this path, but there's no reason they couldn't. So I think over the, you know, the next decade, the, the worry we ought to have is how do we protect that critical infrastructure from a, a, a relatively devastating a, attack in terms of loss of life and also in terms of our economy, our economic well-being. I think that there's a fundamental vulnerability there and I don't think we're treating it as a fundamental vulnerability. I, I, I couldn't agree more. Uh, and we've got some, some folks, I'm looking at you, Richard Baitlich, in, in, in the room who, who, who can talk to those issues. Uh, in, in detail, I do sometimes wonder, from a North Korean perspective, what a, a sophisticated cyber attack would look like. I think it would be like a d distributed denial of service on our fax machines or something. That like <laughs> the, the new, uh, uh, that new technology. Your watch that, would stop. Yeah, working. yeah, exactly. Well, I don't think it connects to a network even to check that it's the right time. It's really yeah. quite bizarre. Yeah. Um, but uh, circling back and just thinking about this this conversation that, that, that we've had, if we, if we take everything in summary or in sum. What are going to be the, 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 what's the difference between strategic success and strategic failure? We've talked about, it's not just, a, when we talk about technology, we can't consider it in isolation. It's that whole context. If we factor that in, what's the difference between being successful and, 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 and failing? Uh, Bill? Well, I mean, I think being successful here is going to be to, uh, as I started, is to recognize that we're at a, a, a fundamental change point in terms of our industrial structure that uh, we're becoming more commercial in terms of the source of our technology, we're coming more, becoming more global in terms of the, the, industrial, uh, the industrial base, 
and the budget pressures are going to uh, lead to more consolidation. And uh, those things are going to change the structure of the industry. The question is whether industry and government are going to manage that change. As we have, you know, at the end of the Cold War with the la last suppers we did in World War II, mm -hmm with the creation of, of the, the, really the first defense industrial base. I think we have a similar challenge now to manage that change that will protect our, our technological advantages. Yeah, that's a great point. That's yeah. strategic success. Yeah, yeah. I, I would say we, we know what strategic failure looks like. It's called the 20th century. Mm. Um, think back 100 years ago, uh, if this panel were going on, um, in Europe, 1914, you see the march toward war. Um, Harlan Ullman's writing a book about this. And there is an unpackaging that occurs from 1914 through the end of the Second World War, in which you can almost pick a number, 60 million people probably are killed. Um, that is strategic failure of a profound kind. So why did that happen? I would argue it happened in large part because we tried to rely on creating walls for our security. We had the Schlieffen Plan, the Maginot Line, the Iron Curtain, the Bamboo Curtain, the Berlin Wall, the DMZ, et cetera. Um, we tried to build these walls. 21st century security will be based not on walls, but on bridges. And I think that our conversation today kind of reflects that. It, it's how we can find points of collaboration with allies, partners, and friends. It's how defense can collaborate with um, the private sector as well, as in national defense with the private sector, the industrial base. And it's, it's private sector and commercial with the government in cyber, I think. These are examples. Mm -hmm. So building these kind of bridges, I think, are our best chance at security, and that would be success in the 21st century. So th th those are great answers. If we apply that to, to the context of, of the United States and its allies, what's the outlook over the next 15 years? Are you guys feeling positive or not? I, I feel positive strategically mm. over the long throw. Um, I think we're going to see some tactical, uh, tactically dark moments, as we are, for example, in Syria today, which mm. is a disaster of, of approaching epic proportion. Yeah. Um, again, I mentioned Iraq and Mosul, very alarming. Uh, the Russian activities in Ukraine are very worrisome. North Korea, young, untested leader who already has nuclear weapons. Mm. Iran on a march toward, et cetera. So there are a lot of uh, significant tactical challenges out there. But strategically, I'm cautiously optimistic for the reasons we've talked about today. Excellent. Bill, from your perspective? I agree with, uh, with Jim. Uh, that. Uh, Structurally, things are, are quite sound. We're in a strong position in, in, in Asia with the alliances we have. We're even you know, tentatively managing our way uh, through the relationship with China. In, in Europe, we have a very strong uh, alliance. Uh, it continues to be strong. We have challenges with Russia and the UK, Ukraine. But I, as I say, I think the, the structure is, is strong. I agree with Jim. The, the challenge isn't the, the frailty of the structure, the, the challenge is going to be the severity of the tactical problems, whether it's Ukraine or, or North Korea or uh, uh, cyber, cyber mm -hmm. Middle East, uh, Syria. Or, but uh, the, the, the structure is sound, it's going to be how do we, how do we manage the, the very significant challenges uh, within that structure. Yeah. So I think that's a great point for us to, to, to wrap up this part of the conversation. And now we have a chance to, um, to, to ask and, and answer some questions. Just a quick reminder, when I said ask and answer questions, <laughs> you guys can ask the questions. We'll answer the questions. And we're all going to try to avoid monologuing, OK? So we'll, we'll try that. So let's just see if we've got some, some, some questions here. Um, th there's a question just, just, just here for, for us back sec second in. And I apologize if I miss you. The, the lights up here are really quite something. Good morning. Uh, my name is Amanda Claypool, and I'm a national security intern at the Project on Middle East Democracy. Um, and my question is directed towards the Admiral. So you had mentioned um, we need to invest more in people, uh, particularly in foreign languages and political and cultural development in critical areas. Um, so I actually just recently returned from Jordan, where I studied Arabic. Mm -hmm. And I count myself in a number of recent graduates who were developing these skills. And we want to serve our country, but we're finding a lot of 
barriers to entry into actually executing these skills. Um, so I was wondering if you had advice either for recent graduates mm -hmm. in this audience or even hiring managers and how we can meet the supply and the demand. Thank you. Well, go, go obvious, Fletcher School. I, I'll go, you stole my line. <laughs> <laughs> Obviously, you should come to the Fletcher School and get a multidisciplinary, <laughs> a multidisciplinary education and then you'll be highly marketable because 98% of our 2012 and 2013 graduates are employed today in these fields. Um, end of commercial. You should continue to invest in your skills, and, and that is languages. It's also the ability to, um, to move and live overseas, take advantage of that. You should also, I think, as it sounds like you are, consider serving your country. And you can do that in the military. You can do that in government, which is a very proud way to serve in the civil service. Um, you can do that in both domestically and internationally, and that will build your skill sets as well as your resume. Um, and then third and finally, I would suggest continuing to do exactly what you're doing here, which is networking. Come and talk and meet with others who are interested in the big issues of security as you so clearly are, and stay with the language training. I think that'll stand you in very good stead. Excellent. Okay, other questions? So, um, just, yeah. Hello, David Scruggs, Renaissance Strategic Advisors. This question is probably more directed at uh, Secretary Lynn. Uh, one of the keys that you talk about is both getting more commercial technologies into defense as well as getting more international technologies into defense. One of the things that's prohibited that in the past is the U.S. government approach towards intellectual property, which is if we touch it, we own it. And we're going to tell you what you can do with it from now on. Any relief on the future that you see or uh, any words of advice that you see that a positive note there? Well, I mean, I think the barriers you cite are, are significant. The, I mean, the ITAR system is, is a significant uh, barrier in terms of uh, both developing technology here and then, and then competing uh, in, the, in the global market. And the, I think the Obama administration's made a, a very constructive uh, uh, start in terms of start reforming that. It, it, to complete that reform is going to require Congress, and that's a much harder harder road. President uh, Bush uh, took a significant uh, effort in that and, and didn't get much success. Uh, I think we're going to have to, though, uh, uh, keep after that in, in terms of, of, of Congress, and I, I want to see the administration continue uh, what it's doing. At, a, at an overall level, I, I think we are seeing a, I think we will see and are seeing a general shift uh, in the group we talked about. Uh, an analogy to the automobile industry. If you looked at the automobile industry 30 years ago, you'd really see a, a very parochially based industry. It was really almost unpatriotic to drive a, drive a European or Asian car. Uh, and then, but, but since then, the industry's globalized. You don't, I mean, the, the, the largest U.S. Uh, automobile export uh, this past year was BMW. Uh, BMW is built in the U.S., exported overseas. And it's, it's the industry itself has fundamentally changed. It's, it's globalized. People don't really care where the shareholders are based. There's still a lot of concern, certainly where the workers are, but the workers are now globally based, and so it's easier uh, to sell. It's easier to share technology. I think that that, that offers, it's, it's not uh, completely parallel, but I think that offers some instruction in terms of a model defense industry might, might be able to go down. Excellent. Okay, you guys are doing great with asking actual questions. Um, uh, this gentleman here, and then I'll ask some questions and get, get some people from the back later. Uh, I'm Harlan Ullman, a very former naval person. Great panel, but I'm biased. Uh, a paradox and a question. Um, the six or 7,000 Americans killed in Iraq and in Afghanistan were killed by AK-47s and improvised explosive devices, technologies that arguably were 80 years old. And I think that remains a big problem in the future. The question is, you use Joseph Schumpeter for your title. Uh, I think Gordon Moore would have been better as an example. Because my problem is that I think the term industrial is anachronistic. And I think what we have to look towards is a knowledge-based or intellectually property-based sort of system that focuses on knowledge. And I think, Jim, what you say about people and intelligence is really the central key, as well as your bridge building rather than your wall building. And I wonder if you would comment about the notion of an intellectual property or knowledge base system here, which can probably provide something for the conveyor belt that you both suggest. 
yeah, let me, if I can, use something I'm learning about now. I've made this transition from the military to, to the business of education. And so often when we talk about intellectual property, we're talking about how does the widget work? And I'm, I think Bill may be better suited to address that than I. Um, I think that the next big wave in education, in intellectual property, is going to be the distribution of education um, globally, as in professors at Stanford teaching physics for Coursera or edX, which are these massive online courses, and having 15, 30, 45,000 students engaged in it. Um, whether or not universities, as we understand them today, which still teach the exact same way Socrates did, uh, one teacher, a handful of pupils, 2,000-year-old model, um, that's going to change in the next 20 years. And that distribution of intellectual capital around the world, I think, will have profound implications. And we ought to focus on it as a vehicle for creating security, as opposed to being concerned about hiding it like Socrates in the cave. I'd also add that the single most difficult thing in any think tank project is coming up with a title. <laughs> Se second most difficult thing is cover art. Um, so other questions. Uh, up by the back pillar, we have someone uh, with, with, a, with a hand raised. Yep, that's you. There's a, there's a microphone just behind you. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I want to echo Dean Stavridis' comments about the Fletcher School as a now gainfully employed uh, <laughs> Bald 2012, so. You guys need sponsorship here. This is, this is out of we, we don't need sponsorship. We've got the Fletcher yeah, Mafia. We... That's all the sponsorship you need, really. It's always orange ties. I know, right? Yeah. Uh, anyway, my question is about, um, you talk a lot about these, uh, what was it, the conveyor, or the transmission belt of bringing commercial technology, mm -hmm. commercial innovation into the defense world. If you could, if you, both of you could identify one policy barrier and one conceptual barrier to integrating or to leveraging the commercial knowledge that the Defense Department could use, would like to use, but can't currently access. Thank you. Um, I, I, don't, I don't know how to categorize it as conceptual or, or policy. I'll say the political barrier that's created, understandably, when nations want to be proprietary about military technology. So other nations around the world are doing some amazing things. Uh, Israel springs to mind. Um, it's very difficult uh, for us to hook up the transmission belt to a non-US entity. Um, I recognize, believe me, all the political challenges with doing that, but I think the more we can open the transmission belt from them, the more likely it is that our transmission belt will continue to run in the other direction. So I'd say opening up more to the international marketplace, both coming and going. I, mean, I think the, the single thing I'd identify is the inappropriateness of our acquisition system for developing information technology. Everybody, we've had 130 plus studies on, on acquisition reform, and, and they've been focused on improving the system, and, the, the, and that's good, but the system was designed basically to buy large things, to buy platforms, and it's imperfect for that, but it was really designed for that, and we can make incremental improvements and, and, and Im improve that. For information technology, I, mean, I used to say when I was, in the department, it takes us on average eight or nine years to go from you know, initial idea to putting something in the field. It took Steve Jobs two years to do that with, with an iPhone. In the department, it took me that long to get a budget. Uh, uh, and so it, it, that just doesn't work for information technology with, with Moore's Law and, and all the other forces there. You need, a, you need just a fundamental, di fundamentally different approach. Now, Frank Kendall in the department uh, recognize that and are taking that on, but that, in my mind, is the, is the biggest uh, leap that we need to make. Could I just Please. maybe broaden Bill's point slightly and say, uh, in addition to the IT point, I think it's really an attitude toward innovation broadly. And um, when I was the commander of Southern Command before the NATO job, we caught uh, any number of these 
semi-submersibles that were built in the Colombian jungle. These are submersible craft, uh, twin screwed, diesel powered, crew of three, excellent communications, navigation suite, built for 1.2 million mm. in the Colombian jungle. Um, that's innovation. We caught one of those and I put it right in front of the headquarters of U.S. Southern Command because I wanted everybody every day driving up to the building to think our opponents are smart. Yeah. They're innovators. They have a culture of innovation. And how we inculcate that, I think, is, is fundamental to how this 21st century unspools for the United States. Right. I'm not sure that their accounting systems would be compliant <laughs> with our, our, our defense uh, yeah. uh, systems, though. So we, I'm not sure we'll be able to collaborate it's with them. It's a cash and carry business. That's right. That's, a, that, that, that's the only issue. You ought to the, know that. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> So I, I can't think of a better note to, to, to end our conversation on. So I apologize that we couldn't get to, 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 to all of the questions. Um, I would encourage you to, to take a look at the report that we've put together and also check out the CNS website. We did a number of surveys and, and we have interviews with a number of the people who participated in the project online. Um, I'd also encourage you to continue to watch this space. This report raised more issues than it, than it, than it solved problems. Uh, and so it behooves us at CNS to sort of uh, try to make good on some of those recommendations. So watch for us to do some more work on what comes after an offset strategy. Um, in closing, I'd like to thank a number of people. Uh, we had a, a large number of people who participated in this project. They're all listed in the report. Many of them are here today. Uh, Dennis Boven from our board. Um, I think I saw August Cole. Um, and a number of other ex excellent people who participated. I also really want to thank my uh, extremely talented colleague and co-author Kelly Saylor. You should find her. She's busy working here instead of just uh, swanning about up on the stage. Have a chat with her. Mike Horowitz, who did our surveys. Uh, and especially, I would like to thank uh, these two fine gentlemen here. Thank you very much. And thank you, thank you all of you. Thank you. Thank you. We can Thanks make a lot, Thank you.